When scientists discover a new species, the common practice is to collect at least one specimen. The first animal collected is called the holotype and is used to name the species and as a reference for its physical description. While this practice may seem cruel to some, it's an incredibly useful and necessary scientific practice for future study. Sometimes a species is collected once, maybe two or three times, and then never seen again. The only evidence we have of their existence is the specimen in a museum collection. In this video, we're looking at five species that have only ever been seen a handful of times, in some cases, only once ever. Welcome back to All About Nature. On my channel, I try to bring nature-related content that's both educational and entertaining. If you like this kind of content, then please consider liking the video, leaving a comment, or even subscribing to the channel. I also want to quickly thank my patrons. It's through their support that I'm able to continue making weekly content. If you'd like to become a patron and have early access to the videos, check out the link in the video description below. In 1783, English ornithologist John Latham published his work A General Synopsis of Birds. At this point in European history, many wealthy men were collecting animal specimens from around the world. Latham visited stately homes and museums to document the species he found. Often, they were still undescribed. In his book, he mentions seeing two specimens of what he called the spotted green pigeon. The species had dark brown feathers with a green shine to them. The feathers on the neck were elongated, and on the wings, each of the feathers had a yellow or white tip, giving it a spotted appearance. One of the specimens was in the collection of the English major Thomas Davies, and the other in the collection of naturalist Joseph Banks. How these two men got these specimens is unknown, but both collectors were known to have contacts in the South Pacific so the two birds were assumed to have originated on an island somewhere in that region. They also looked similar in appearance to the Nicobar pigeon, which also inhabits islands in the region, adding credibility to the theory. The bird in Davies' collection eventually made its way to the World Museum in Liverpool, while the specimen Banks had was lost. This is the only specimen of the spotted green pigeon that exists in any museum collection in the world today. Generally, in order to claim a species as unique, multiple specimens are needed. So the spotted green pigeon was overlooked in scientific literature throughout the 20th century. In 2001, English writer Errol Fuller brought the species back into the public eye. He called the bird the Liverpool pigeon and felt strongly that it was in fact a unique species. At the same time, Ornithologist David Gibbs suggested that the bird was only superficially similar to the Nicobar pigeon, but also felt that it was its own species. By examining the specimen, it's clear that the spotted green pigeon was arboreal, while the Nicobar pigeon prefers to walk on the ground. This swayed the scientific community, and the spotted green pigeon was listed as extinct by the IUCN in 2008. But the mystery of its origin remains. The main hypothesis was put forward by David Gibbs. In 1928, a book was published called Ancient Tahiti. It was based on the writings of Tahitian scholar and historian Teoria Henry, who was actively writing about Tahitian history through the late 19th century. Her work was based on her grandfather's notes on the region, and in his notes, he mentions a bird. The titi, which cried titi, now extinct in Tahiti, was speckled green and white, and it was the shadow of the mountain gods. Gibbs thought that this may well be a description of the spotted green pigeon, but other scholars disagree, as titi is frequently used to describe shearwaters in the region, even to this day. We may never know where the species once lived. For now, the only specimen in existence is kept in environmentally controlled storage at the World Museum in Liverpool. On December 30th, 1960, a fishing vessel that was trawling off the southeastern coast of Australia 
caught something no one had seen before. Bottom trawling is rather controversial. It involves weighing a large net down so it drags along the bottom of the ocean. As the ship pulls it along, it captures large numbers of fish, but it also rips up and destroys everything along the ocean floor. Corals and seaweeds are decimated, leaving no habitat for many species to occupy after the net has passed. This style of fishing also can mean a lot of bycatch. These are the species that are unintentionally captured by the nets during the process. On this day near the town of Eden, a male of a tiny species of seahorse was caught in the net. It eventually made its way to a museum, where it sat in their collection for nearly 40 years. Over that time, two more seahorses, a female and a juvenile, that matched the same description were also caught by trawling nets. These seahorses were exceptionally small, belonging to the hippocampus genus, otherwise known as the pygmy seahorses. No pygmy seahorse species was described until 1969. They're so small and blend in so well with the corals that they live on that it wasn't until more advanced diving equipment was invented that the seahorses could be observed in the wild. In 1997, Dr. Martin F. Goman described the species based off the three specimens in museum collections. He named it Hippocampus minotaur. Minotaurs are mythical creatures with human bodies and the head of a bull. Goman felt that the species resembled a minotaur due to its disproportionately sized head and graceful body. The species was given the common name of bullneck seahorse. The areas where the seahorses were caught were described as having generally sandy bottoms with minimal corals, but all pygmy seahorses are known to live on gorgonian corals, so it's believed that bullneck seahorses likely do the same. They've never been observed in the wild, and in 2017, Rewild added them to their list of the 25 most wanted lost species. No formal search has been done for the bullneck seahorse as of yet, and the IUCN lists them as data deficient. Another species listed on Rewild's list of 25 most wanted species is Zoog's monitor. Monitors can be found in much of Africa, Asia, and Australia. Indonesia has 19 species, and while some are extremely common, like the Asian water monitor, some are among the rarest on Earth. This includes Zug's monitor. In eastern Indonesia are the Maluku Islands. They're covered in dense tropical rainforest and are an under-researched biodiversity hotspot. In recent years, plenty of new species have been described, including Zug's monitor. In 1980, a biological expedition to the region collected a variety of species. One was this monitor lizard, which was captured alive and photographed. It was initially misidentified as a mangrove monitor. It was then euthanized for the museum collection and taken to the National Museum of Natural History in the US. Then it was forgotten about. But in 2005, a German biologist who was studying the herpetological specimens at the museum realized that this specimen from 1980 was not actually a mangrove monitor at all. Juvenile mangrove monitors are heavily spotted, while the specimen in the collection was not. It was realized that it represented a new species to science, and it was named after George and Patricia Zug for their contributions to the field of herpetology. The specimen in the museum is a juvenile, so it hadn't yet reached its full size. It measures 36 centimeters in total length. It's a silver grayish color on the body and patternless except for scattered bluish scales. The tail also has about a dozen faint bands towards the tip and the underside is yellowish and unpatterned. Interestingly, it's believed that a couple of Zoog's monitors may have made it into the pet trade over the years, but this is unconfirmed. And after being added to Rewild's list of 25 most wanted species, there was renewed interest in rediscovering it. A website was set up to help raise funds for the expedition, with Robert Downey Jr. promising to match some of the donations given to the project. In early 2023, the money was raised, and expedition plans are in progress. 
This will be one of the first times that eDNA will be used to try to rediscover a species. eDNA is genetic information of species present in an ecosystem that's found in the environment, like in the soil, air, and water. Minuscule amounts of DNA can be detected to know what species are present, even if they're never seen. The team also wants to avoid collecting another specimen of Zug's monitor, as there's no way of knowing how endangered the species may be. Instead, they'll be using a 3D scanner that can fit into a backpack that will take a detailed scan of any specimen found for future study. The Mauke starling is sometimes called the mysterious starling because of all the confusion a simple transcription mistake caused. In 1825, Sir Walter Buller, an ornithologist in New Zealand, received a specimen of a new species of starling. It was a dull, dusky black color overall, with lighter brown feather edges, which were prominent on the body feathers. It had a yellow iris and dusky brown feet and bill. The specimen came with a collection card that recorded the name of the new species. But when he was copying the name, Buller made a mistake. On the collection card, the species was named Aplonus inornata, in reference to its dull appearance. But Buller recorded the species as Aplonus mavornata. It's unclear whether he simply misread the label or made a deliberate change, seeing as another species of starling had recently been named using inornata. Nevertheless, the bird was officially named Aplonus mavernata and remains so to this day. Over the coming decades, no one could figure out where the specimen originated, as there were no field records of Aplonus mavernata anywhere. Then, in the late 19th century, a British ornithologist named Richard Sharp came across this painting. It was made by English ornithologist George Forster in June of 1774 on the island of Rayatea in French Polynesia. Sharp was certain that this bird was the same as the starling specimen named Aplonus mavernata, and many other authors pushed this theory for decades. But the two birds didn't seem to fully match in their descriptions. Still, it was the best theory at the time and accepted by most. But around the same time, there was another mysterious starling from the same area. On August 9, 1825, English naturalist Andrew Bloxham was on the tiny island of Mauke in the Cook Islands when he saw a species of starling hopping around in a tree. He made note of it in his diary, and this was eventually published in a scientific journal. But that was the full mention of the species. He also recorded at the same time that rats introduced by recent visitors to the island had become rampant, and by the time ornithologists revisited the island of Mauke in 1973, no species of starling could be found. It was assumed to have gone extinct shortly after Bloxham encountered it, due to the introduction of rats. Scientists assumed that Bloxham had collected the bird as a scientific specimen to send off to a museum, but the specimen was missing. It took over a century for researchers to be able to piece everything together. First, in the 1950s, a German ornithologist named Erwin Stressmann debunked the theory that the museum specimen was the same as the bird in Forrester's drawing, based off of the indiscrepancies in appearance. Then, in 1986, American ornithologist Storrs Olsen discovered that the dates of Bloxham's discovery of a starling on Mauke Island and the date of Buller recording a species of starling named Aplonus mavernata aligned. Now the only mystery is the identity of the starling in Forrester's painting from 1774. Today it's recorded as Aplonus uliatensis, and the only knowledge of its existence is this single painting. It's assumed to have gone extinct. In New Zealand in 1887, Belgian-British zoologist George Albert Bullinger was given a long, slim, brown skink from a friend. He had never seen it before, and he described it as a new species. He gave it the scientific name 
oligosoma infrapunctatum, and it became commonly known as the speckled skink. The origin of the lizard was unfortunately not recorded, but nevertheless, the specimen was sent on to the British Museum. Over the next 130 years, the skink was discovered to be living in a variety of locations across both the North and South Islands, and each time they were discovered, specimens were collected. They lived in a variety of habitats, including open forest, scrubland, and even disturbed land like farms. But over the last few years, scientists have been taking a closer look at these brown skinks, and they started to notice that they weren't quite the same. Each specimen lives in a different part of the country and has small but significant variations in genetics, coloration, scale composition, and limb structure. Instead of it being a single species, scientists discovered that they actually had five different species in museum collections in New Zealand. So they sent for the holotype specimen from London to see which one of the five species it was. To their surprise, it was different from all the others, making it a sixth species. And amazingly, the original specimen was the only one of that species to have ever been collected. Today, it's unknown if the original species collected is now extinct, or if it's living in some tiny range somewhere in the country, waiting to be rediscovered. Some of the remaining five species are really struggling. One of them, the Alborn skink, only has a two hectare range, and a recent survey only turned up one lizard. Another, the Chesterfield skink, has lost so much of its habitat to agricultural development that they now have a range of only 0.01 square kilometers. And that's it for today's video. I have five more lined up for a part two, if that's something that interests you. Let me know in the comments. And before you leave, don't forget to help me out with a like, or even a subscription if you want to come back for the next one. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.